Everybody out there? Good. Okay, uh, tonight I'm gonna talk about my new book, which is out today, um, A Mindfulness Guide for Survival. Uh, so today I'm a new mother and um, I'm exhausted from pushing for nine months. Uh, so I'm thrilled to tell you about my child. And um, as with all mothers, I want her to survive and I want her to be as loved by you as she's loved by me. Anyway, I wrote, I wrote it as a workbook and I know a lot of you have got it now. I wrote it during lockdown to be able to, well, to be able to check in with myself, how I was feeling throughout and what I could do to help myself get through it. I really think it's this self-reflection. Uh, you know, it gets it out of your system so you're not kind of clogged with anxiety. So it's a workbook, as I say, it's um, for you to write in. You can scribble in it, you can doodle in it, you can make it into a hat. Use it when you need it, okay? Um, no one but you is gonna see inside of it. But if you practice the exercise in the book, you know, while you're doodling and coloring, it just might become your tool of tools for holding on to your mind while all around you people are losing theirs. So think of it as a guide, um, how to drop anchor when your life and the world just gets too daunting. You know, I always figure that we're in the same storm. It's just we're in different boats. It's a survival book, um, how to get through a day without thinking that we failed, that we didn't do enough. You know, those critical thoughts that keep going. I could have, I shouldn't, uh, you know, nagging thoughts. I always feel like somebody implanted my mother in my head. And I'm writing this book to remind everyone that who we are is enough. And that if we can believe that, if we can create a calmer environment inside of us, it'll impact what's outside of us too. And don't think of it so much as a help a self-help book. Think of it more, I like to flatter myself, as an evolve yourself book. So I'll just go on about what happened last year. You know, if anyone had told us a few weeks before March 2020 that most of the world was going to be unable to leave their homes because a virus was going to go on a rampage, we would have said, oh, well, that's a film on Netflix and the script is way too far-fetched. And then it slowly dawned on us that we were about to have a showdown at high noon with our deepest fear. There were no information packs as to what to do with this kind of emergency. And so we're suddenly locked in, in our homes and a horror of horrors, we found ourselves with no distraction. You know, we're, we were desperate to find something to do, something, you know, to go outside, to shop, uh, to do something, but, you know, make a list, but then you couldn't do the list. We had to sit there distractionless and face ourselves. <laughs> and in the beginning for the first few weeks, people panicked about that. I mean, I know that I hoovered like there was no tomorrow. I know a lot of people were doing that. I think I hoovered in the same area down to the magma of the earth over and over again. Every crevice in my home was cleaned. My socks sparkled. I couldn't stop cleaning. I think I ironed my husband, anything just to not have to face my fears. And the virus impacted everyone, everyone, but everyone differently in a way. Some people froze, some people panicked, some people tried to escape, others wept all the time. But, you know, to say, let me just say, I think everybody was affected in some way. And I, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but I think that maybe trauma just might be the next pandemic. Because, you know, with the war, if there was an actual war, we'd see the bombs falling and then you would know to run to a shelter, to the underground. But with this one, you know, with this virus, even your best friend could be a sniper. I remember I used to see kids in the park and I would suddenly scream incoming and run for a bush. It was terrifying. And the reason we were so ill-prepared for this recent existential slap in the face is that we were suddenly forced to, confront the harsh realities of life, which we never really faced before, or we chose not to. And in the book, I call them the big six, which I list. Um, there's more obviously, but I just chose these. We do not face things like difficult emotions. We avoid those uncertainty, change, loneliness, dissatisfaction, and death. And I'll tell you in a minute why I chose those and what to do about how to, obviously they're still gonna be there, but how to maybe navigate, you know, surf the waves rather than sink in them. I mean, we were lonely before the pandemic. We were fearful of change and uncertainty and dare I say death, but 
who wants to think about this stuff when, when there's so much on Netflix to watch? I mean, we should have been taught how to deal with them during our first years in school, like in a, you know, in a child-friendly way. Maybe even parents could just gently but honestly tell their kids that the fish died and what that means rather than just saying, well, the fish went to heaven. But as I say, we never faced those realities before. Maybe we were too busy because we were, as I say, all on that tight schedule of things to be done. Most of the things we didn't even need to do, but we fooled ourselves that we were so important, you know, that the world would grind to a halt if we didn't do those things on our list. So many deadlines self-imposed to keep that adrenaline pumping, to give us a sense of purpose and importance. And as I said before, we do anything then have to look too deeply into ourselves. Any diversion was appreciated. I mean, before the pandemic, before the pandemic, we didn't know we didn't notice any of this stuff. We were glued to our digital rectangles, as I call them, our heads permanently sucked into cyberspace. You know, I think one of the culprits was Microsoft. Um, they said about 10 years, they said, now you can take the office into your home, you know? And that was the beginning of the end. We didn't just bring it home, we married it. Now we carry around an eye husband or an eye wife with eye kids. Technology really should have helped us with some of the pressure, but it didn't. I mean, wasn't the point of technology so that it was fast and efficient so that we could have spare time? Anybody know what spare is? It's like a foreign word. We're not using tech these days, it's using us. Why can't somebody code it to hit deadlines and let the software burn out rather than us? That's all I'm asking. You know, and we were supposed to all connect. It was supposed to help us connect, yet we've never been so far apart. You know, at the time back, yet we were all hunkered in our corners, huddled in the darkness, once in a while sending out a tweet like a flare from the sinking Titanic, just to show everybody we were alive. Anyway, once lockdown started, we were forced to cold turkey off our businesses, our busyness, which meant we'd have to be alone with our thoughts. And suddenly we saw ourselves naked with no masks to hide behind, no personalities to jack up, no parties to be invited to, and never, never having to dress up, especially our lower halves. And I, I'll tell you something, Once, one thing that really made me crazy was the news and I became addicted to it. You know, 24 seven worth of horror shows telling us one disaster after another. It was like on a drip field, feet of fear. I always think that BBC News should have started off with the music of, accompanied with the lyrics of Bring Out Your Dead. I mean, I, it was like a death knell every night. And I think if COVID doesn't kill you, you know, the stress of all this will. And the way I, wasn't just my feelings, the way I gathered this kind of information, I said I had a front row seat to all of this panic. I, I witnessed the daily onslaught of all this, you know, how people were reacting because at the time, well, I still am, I'm running something called Frazzled Cafe, which um, started about, I know it sounds like I'm going off piece. I started about four years ago. Um, we had it in Marks and Spencer's up and down the country and small groups of about 12 to 14 would meet with a facilitator. And it would sort of be, I based it on an AA meeting, but um, it doesn't have the 12 step program, but it was a chance to make a small community and people could speak from the heart. I really, I, originally I wanted to join AA, but they said, I didn't pass, you know, because I wasn't an alcoholic. So I thought, well, I want something like it. So I created Frazzle. And so the facilitators worked in Marks and Spencer's for three years. Then when the lockdown happened, I took on um, Frazzle in the evening. So I did it every night and I'd have about 80 people who would do, you know, speak human. They would have, um, a moment where they could, we weren't allowed to talk about the news and this wasn't therapy, but they could for a few minutes say what was going on in them. I always said, tell me what the weather conditions are in your mind. And, and they would speak. And every time somebody said something, you know, said their truth, you'd see about 80 heads going, oh yeah, that's me too. And that's really when humans are relieved when we feel that somebody cares about us, you know, and they go, oh yeah, that's my story. It doesn't matter what color you are, uh, what age, you know, suddenly we were gathered together and 
that's what got me through the pandemic. So I did get the pulse of the nation, I feel, you know, and every night they would talk about those realities. You know, they were slapped in the face by that daily, as I say, those, you know, how to deal with change, uncertainty, loneliness, death, and um, these difficult emotions. And that's what inspired me to write A Mindfulness Guide for Survival. So I'll talk a little bit about my big six. I think you'll agree that they are the big realities. So difficult emotions, okay, we have them. They're part of our repertoire. Um, we need emotions, first of all, because without them, we wouldn't be able to navigate the world. Uh, it lets us know what's safe and what's not safe. I mean, we need fear. We need it. Otherwise, you know, there'd be no fight or flight. We need that to take on a predator. We did need it in the past, right? This part in our brain called the amygdala would sound an alarm when we were frightened and we gush cortisol to be able to take on the foe or run from it. And then after the incident was over and we'd know the results because either we were lunch or having lunch, the amygdala, the deactivate the cortisol would come down and we'd be calm again. Part of difficult emotions these days is we're never calm in this culture, we're always alarmed. Because as I said, technology, social media, the news, that's where we get into trouble. But as I say, the pure emotions we need, we need fear for survival. We need um, anger because, uh, you know, we need to ward off the enemy, whoever that is, you know, a really good technique for that is screaming. We need anxiety so that we have our guns cocked in case there's trouble. All these emotions we need, disgust, shame, panic, fear, they all have a point and they're all part of the human package. But when we um, try to suppress those feelings, they will eventually explode out. And none of these feelings are bad. It's just when we keep we keep them on the boil, we constantly go and feel these, you know, this horror show. And that's when it when it becomes chronic, it becomes dangerous. And let me say people who think, oh, Ruby, you just talk about mental problems. Let me just say mental is physical. Okay, there's no difference. The mind and the body are a onesie. So if there's too much cord too much stress up here from being at the mercy of fear or panic or anxiety, what happens is that cortisol, it works its way through your system like a pinball machine, hits your adrenal glands and gushes out. And that's what breaks down your immune system. And you know we need that immune system, especially now. So forget about saying it's mental. You will kill yourself physically because a lot of illnesses are caused by this cortisol. Um, certain cancers, diabetes, two heart disease, infertility, obesity, premature aging, all of them physical and all of them because of stress. A lot of it is genes, but I'm telling you stress feeds into it. So reality number two is uncertainty. And um, the only thing we can be certain about in this world is uncertainty. Um, I mean, there are very few guarantees in this world. We're certain that gravity works and most of us are carbon based, but outside of that, I wouldn't place any bets. Everything is uncertain. So it's better to be ready. I mean, who you are today is not who you were when you were being potty trained. Change happens, okay? Uncertainty happens. The third of reality is loneliness. And as I say, I always felt lonely from when I was a kid. You know, even though I get a lot of people because I'm funny and I attract a lot of people, kind of inside, there's a sort of nobody gets me. You know, and, and the point of humans is to mingle and bond. And hopefully now after the pandemic, we can start to um, understand the importance of community because it was such a high when everybody clanged their pots and pants for the NHS, that was so exciting. So we have to understand we need each other. And to understand loneliness, to understand the difference between feeling isolated and lonely it really will motivate us to connect together. Well, I got that on Frazzle Cafe is that we really paid attention to each other and cared. So out of the loneliness came this thrust to care about other people. Reality number four is change. And again, this causes us so much misery. People thinking, oh, why can't I stay young forever? Why can't I stay in love? 
you know, we can't. Impermanence is the law of the universe. Hold on to your pants because the next time moves, <laughs> it's going to happen again. We are never the same from one second to the next. I mean, every second, a trillion cells in my arm alone will die and a trillion more are born. Everything is always on the move. And the more you accept that, the less kind of rigid you get when something, when the, when the rug is pulled out from under you. Five is dissatisfaction. And humans get it into their heads that they should want what they have instead of have what they want. It's this endless craving that brings us to our knees with frustration and then blows our self-esteem to smithereens. <laughs> You know, part of it is we're problem solvers. We always think that there's a <clears throat> there's an answer to everything. But sometimes there's a gap, especially emotionally. I mean, there's a problem because we might feel sad or might feel isolated. But there's no answer to how that can be, how we can work with it. There's a gap between this needing and feeling and not being able to get there. So there's this constant agitation. And social media doesn't help. We're never the prettiest. We're never the most successful. You know, you know, you can never come in first. It's not like high school. When I went, you know, you could be the most popular. But there were only 30 kids, you know, 30 girls to compete with. Now you're competing with the world. So, of course, there's always this niggling self, low self-esteem that you're not doing enough. And number six is death. Uh, that's the one thing you can depend on. I'm, I'm not here to upset you, but like the Girl Scouts taught me, be prepared. You can only savor moments in your life if you hold on to the thought that we all have a sell-by date. Everybody's biodegradable, but this isn't to depress you. This is to say, really, be aware every moment. Who do you want to be with? What do you want to be doing? Um, what makes your life have meaning? It's something, again, we haven't been paying attention to. So I, when I say death, I don't mean, you know, our, our demise. I mean, be aware this isn't, a, life is not a rehearsal. This is the real performance. So how to deal with these big six, um, which is what the book's about and why it's a workbook. So I used my training in mindfulness um, to deal with them. And I studied mindfulness because uh, at the time, this is about 15 years ago, I had another serious a serious bout of depression. And so I was looking around to see what was out there so that there's no magic pill, but how could I maybe notice when another depression was coming? Because part of the problem is it just suddenly sabotages you. You know, you're, you're held hostage. One day you're a human, the next day you feel like a slab of cement. So I thought, what can I do to kind of, you know, so I don't have to run to a shrink that I could really feel when it was coming. So I researched everything. I went and I looked at science journals or science books. And at that time, and still to this day, it was what had the most success with um, being able to manage not just depression, but OCD, ADHD, panic, people who are frazzled, normal people who just wanted to have a little more control of their brains was cognitive therapy and mindfulness. I never heard of mindfulness before. It sounded vegetarian. So um I went, I've said this before, I found the professor who created mindfulness-based cognitive therapy because they put it together. And he was a professor at Oxford. So I drove to him and I said, please tell me what happens in the brain because I'm not very, I'm a skeptic. You know, I wrote all the series of, well, I was the editor of all the series of Absolutely Fabulous. So um, anything I can't really see or taste, I'm very skeptical about. You know, I did write lines about uh, hugging your inner elf and taking baths in Himalayan yak breast milk. So I, I really, I wouldn't have gone into mindfulness, but what happened, what lured me was the science. And when I said to the professor, Mark Williams, uh, that I really wanted to study the mind, he said, unfortunately, you'd have to get into Oxford and get your master's if you want to learn about the brain. I, so I did, and nobody was as surprised as him. But I really, I'm, I'm, one thing that turns me on is looking at a brain and noticing what happens when it changes. Um, and you could really see after even a few weeks of mindfulness changes in the brain. And you could see areas that actually 
The way when you're doing a sit up in a gym or you're working out in a gym, you get muscles in certain areas. The same with mindfulness is that it actually buffs up certain areas in the brain. <clears throat> you get more synaptic connections, but let's just call it a muscle. So, you know, you get, there's an area called the insula, which helps you uh, focus more into your senses. The anterior cingulate cortex is in charge of your attention. So mindfulness gives you a way to focus your attention. And we live, as I said, in a culture of, you know, total distraction. It also exercises an area that is associated with being present and other areas that are connected to compassion and self-compassion. And so I use these mindfulness exercises to help deal with the big realities before we get blessed by them and we go under. Okay, let me just say mindfulness is not about sitting on some gluten-free cushion or levitating above it or your eyes thrown back in a state of bliss. What it does, it's a brain exercise. It should be called, I don't know, workout for the brain. But let me just say, <clears throat> I'm going to explain what mindfulness is and take you through, probably most of you know, but take you through an exercise. And again, it's not done all day. It's simply an exercise. Um, and I love that John Kabat-Zinn, who was one of the founders of mindfulness-based stress reduction, and he brought mindfulness to the West, is he says, um, you know, talking about, let's say the hard realities or when life gets bumpy, he said, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf them. So I always like that. I'm gonna explain a little bit about mindfulness. I hope you don't mind. Maybe there's people new to this, but this is the, I don't know, the cleanest explanation I can give for me, all right? Maybe somebody else wants to think it's bliss, but it's not, it's not, you know, I, as I say, I like the biology of it. Um, and I love the brain change. And, I, you know, I'm sure there's other things that work, but Oxford wasn't offering witchcraft. So I thought maybe there is something to mindfulness. So I'll explain a little bit how it works. All right. When the brain is agitated, and I think I made clear that we live now at a time when it's agitated most of the time, you can't think straight. Okay, there's brain fog and you get those critical voices. That's really when there's agitation and stress. Okay, if you're calm, you don't actually have those nagging voices. So it means the amygdala is activated and your gushing cortisol, which I've said is not good for your health. Now, when you take your focus to one of your senses, you know what they are, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, you're activating a different part of your brain called the insula, okay? That switches on and you're sensing something. Now you're not thinking, you're simply seeing or tasting or hearing, all right? Now you can't be in both states at once. You either have the amygdala activated or the insula. It's one or the other. It's like trying to drive a car and being in two gears at once. It can't, it won't move. Okay, so it's one or the other. And like an exercise, like a sit up, every time you, the exercise of mindfulness is you notice the gabbling thoughts, you gently take them to a sense, let's say hearing or following a breath, the thoughts come, we're thinking animals, so we're always thinking we're supposed to. You notice it, you take the thoughts back to the sense, thoughts will grab you again, Gently noticing thoughts taken back to the sense. And each time you do that, it's like doing a sit up, that insula gets more and more buff. So that actually, when the stress really starts kicking in, you can pull focus back to, let's say, one of the senses and dodge some of those mental bullets. Now, thoughts don't go away. People always go, I didn't clear my mind. Well, your mind will never be blank, okay, until you're dead. That's a clue that you've died. Your mind is blank. But what it happens is that the thoughts are more like a radio in another room. I mean, they lose their sting. I still have thoughts, but what you're learning is to observe them rather than be at the mercy of them. And then when you notice that you don't have to take them all so seriously or react to them, you notice that thoughts come and go of their own volition if you don't grab on. I mean, so they just move through like um, Mark Williams says, like clouds in the sky, some are nice, some are heavy, some are fluffy, some are rain clouds, or some of those thoughts are nice, 
Some are mean, some are adorable, some are pornographic. They just keep moving through. They can be hurtful, they can be terrible, they can be joyous. Again, you're learning to observe. You know, you're watching the thoughts. So you don't get so captured by them. Not that thoughts are bad, okay? Like we need thoughts for civilization to happen. You know, for art, for literature, for, for gossip. We need thoughts, but the problem is when they're good, they're very, very good. That's not the problem. When they're bad and they turn on us, they're evil. So with mindfulness, you can start to pick and choose what thoughts are useful and which ones are going to make you crash and burn. And now you have a choice. You know, like somebody conducting an orchestra. I want that one. I don't want that one. Use it for problem solving. But when they turn on you and tell you, you know, that you're not good enough, you can actually lay back and go, okay, I'm not going to take that one seriously. So let's do a little bit of mindfulness. Okay. All right. Um, I can't see you, but I assume you're doing this with me. You come away from the back of your chair a little bit or sofa. So the spine's self-supporting because you want to have a feeling of alertness and awakeness. Heads balanced on the neck, shoulders down. You can have your eyes open or shut. This is up to you. So if we take our focus as far away from this mind gabbling as we can, which is the opposite end of your body. It's your feet. So let's send focus to the feet now, just sensing where they make contact with the ground. Just feeling both feet being pulled to the ground or sensing the bottom of your shoe. It's not an area we really experience a lot. So if you don't feel anything, just register a blank. See if you can sense from the toes to the heels, side to side, whether they're tingling or pulsing or neutral. And then just let that image go and reroute your focus to where you feel you're making contact with the chair. So feel the outside of your, your thighs, your pelvis, wherever you make contact with the chair, focus in on it, notice the sensations. sort of feeling the effect of gravity pulling you to the chair. All right, you can let go of that and now bring in your focus to another sense. Just bring it to sound. It's a sense, so just listen. Just notice what's coming in the right ear, left, above, below, in front. Don't look for the sound, just let it come to you. And your mind will come in, the thoughts will snare you. They have to do this. This is what thoughts do. And you might notice the theme, they're either, I don't know, worrying or planning, or they don't even make sense. You're, you don't even know where your mind is gone. It's just, you're not listening anymore. When you notice, okay, don't get angry. Don't think you've done something wrong. Gently take your focus back, back to sound. So you're just listening again. Okay, thoughts will come. Yabber, yabber, yabber. You congratulate yourself. You notice the thoughts because that's mindfulness, noticing. And then without giving yourself a hard time, because a little self-compassion comes into it, bring your focus back to the sound. Letting go of the sound and taking your focus to another sense, which is breathing. Feel the breath, but just notice where your attention is pulled. Where in your, in your body is it? Tip of the nose, throat, chest, abdomen. Just notice where it's most vivid and follow that air going in and going out. Don't try and take over. Let the breath just do what it does. Notice how deep the breath is or quick. Thoughts will come in, maybe saying, look how well I'm doing, what's happening tomorrow, just noticing, that's fine, it's a thought. And then just bring your focus back to the breathing. And now maybe to finish, 
Let's see if we can count five breaths. Okay, just to narrow the focus. So in out is one, we'll go to five. But again, just if you lose your way, that's okay. You haven't done anything wrong. Come back to one. And let the breath take as long or short or whatever as it can. But we're trying to go to five. Doesn't matter if you don't, it's about noticing. So in out is one. Okay, you can stop now. Yeah, doesn't matter where you were, just noticing where the mind, where the mind went. So it doesn't just lower the stress, which is the great thing that mindfulness does, but it also lowers those thoughts, you know, those nagging thoughts, because the lower the cortisol, there's a clearer mind. So now you can actually, you're not trying to avoid thoughts. You want a little bit of insight, which is the greatest gift humans have is how do we think? Who are we? Okay, there is no exact who are you, but you can notice habits of thinking. And to notice it means you're free from them. You know, there's, I always get stuck in certain habits. Like, um, for example, if this is an experiment, if somebody, if you, if you imagine you're walking down the street and a friend of yours is walking the opposite way on the other side of the street and they don't notice you, what's your reaction? Well, I always think it's because they hate me <laughs> and they, they're ignoring me, but that's my habit over and over again. I don't know, what's your reaction? Everybody has a different one. We all see the world in a different way. Everybody's got a different lens. That's why when there's a car accident, everybody has another opinion. Luckily, there's a judge with a hammer. Otherwise, we'd never come to any conclusion. But we see the world differently. So the liberating thing is to understand these are just habits of thinking these thoughts. They aren't solid. One of the um, questions I have in the book is to really understand that we're much more complex than the labels we give ourselves. And this also works with insight. So one of the questions, I don't know if... Um, Josh can put it up, but there's an exercise um, that says, the question is, who are you? And then you ask these questions, have you got it? Yeah, we'll bring that up for you now. Yeah, and each time you ask yourself the question, write something, write first, who are you, okay? And then the next question is, who are you again? And when you write the answer, don't use what you asked in, you know, what you wrote down the first time. Write something you didn't say before. And then after you fill that in, the question is again, who are you? Or who am I? And again, write something you didn't answer before. All right, the first thing is to know all the answers are correct. We humans always think it's a test. So yes, everybody's passed. The point of that questionnaire is that we aren't our job, we're not our school, we're not our clothes, our status, our personality, how smart we are, how pretty. We are far more than the descriptions we give ourselves. Our thoughts, as I said, are more ebb and flow. We're humans are a work in progress, always shape-shifting like a pile of sand in the desert being blown by the wind. Isn't that poetic? We think who we are is based on thinking, you know, that we picked up habits along the way. So I have another questionnaire, just so you can get a little bit more insight, which is what are your thinking habits? Okay, because knowledge is power. So there's a questionnaire, I don't know if you have this, Josh. It says, which internal phrases are most familiar to you? These are my top ones, add your own. But mine are, I'm not good enough. No one cares about me. I'm so selfish. I'm too needy. I should have done something and I didn't. And then the next question is, what are the styles of your thinking that describe the style of your thinking when you're under stress? So some of the styles are catastrophizing, which is everything that happens to me is the worst that can happen. Self-blame, 
everything that happens is my fault. By the way, these are all my habits. Finding someone else to blame, going numb, your body and your brain shut down. Brain bombing is relentless incoming of more critical thoughts. I don't think I go numb, but I get brain bombing and catastrophizing, like everything is always the worst. So I give these questionnaires um, and part of this besides thought insight is emotional insight because we need to know what we're feeling. And again, if we're caught, let's say in certain emotions, let's say we're always heartbroken like thoughts or I'm always sad, it's better if you know that then you can break it. So I do an exercise in mindfulness. Um, maybe I'll do that with you. So getting to know, we've now recognizing our thoughts, maybe just to see where we're always pulled and now getting to know what our emotions are. So let's do that. So let's shut our eyes again. Shoulders down, a little bit away from the back of the chair. Eyes open or shut again, feet on the ground, feet grounded, bum on the chair and now just let the breaths go in and out of your whole body. So it's like you're a balloon. Skin stretching when you breathe in and contracting when you breathe out. And now just maybe bring an incident to mind that brings up an emotion for you. Okay, not anything intense, but just maybe something light. And maybe it's an emotion you're feeling more than others. There's a theme that's familiar. So see where that emotion is in your body. Could be stabbing in the heart or clenching of the stomach or any part of your body. Just hone in on where that is with your sensations, not thoughts. Just you're curious, you're feeling it. So your insula is activated. You may have to say the story a little bit more to feel it. Once you feel the emotion, go in there with curiosity and see if you know where the edges are, what the shape is, maybe the weight, texture, is it throbbing or pulsing? And just breathe into that area. So this is getting to know what your default mode is and also relating to thoughts differently and emotions. The minute you take your focus to these feelings, the cortisol comes down. And then you befriend these emotions. You know, they're nothing to be afraid of, they're just feelings. So breathing into it, when the thoughts come in with the story, just come back to where you felt the emotion and breathe. And notice if they change or they move to another part of your body or they shrink or they stay the same or they disperse. And now just come back to breathing. So now you're learning to have compassion for yourself when you feel those emotions rather than going into your head and um, fantasizing and telling the story. You know, the emotions are there, get to know them. Understand that, you know, these also come and go. You're not stuck with them. You know, they, they're fluid. If you stay with the, if you stay with them, feeling them, and you don't allow the thoughts to snowball, snowball and go into a mountain, you know, grow. The feelings change on their own accord. You know, they're sometimes you notice that it doesn't stay stuck in heartache or whatever. They move. Sometimes it goes to anger. Sometimes it, suddenly joy comes in. It's only the stories we tell ourselves that solidifies, solidifies your feelings and creates this momentum. So um, some of it, let me just say how this relates um, to our, let's say our fear of emotions or fear of being alone or fear of change is that 
as much as the mind can manufacture in happiness, it can also manufacture, uh, sorry, the way the mind can manufacture unhappiness, it can also manufacture happiness. And part of practicing mindfulness is that the more you uh, practice, let's say feeling the positive impact, the more the neurons wire and that becomes a new habit. You know, you, you where you pay attention defines who you are. If you keep noticing horrible things and you become addicted to it, the brain reflects that. If you turn your focus to something more positive, the brain reflects that, but you have to do it intentionally. Otherwise, we're caught. We're caught in our emotions, let's say sadness or unhappiness. You have to train yourself to actually open the heart a little bit. So especially with loneliness or with dissatisfaction or with change, this is how you actually imbue these feelings with a little positivity. So let me just explain the cortisol is what makes you agitated and what fuels the brain and provokes the fear. There's something called oxytocin, which we also create, the humans are capable of creating, and this is kind of the love chemical. It, it's what makes you bond. It's when you have a relationship. A mother has this oxytocin when she has a baby, it comes on automatically. And she passes it to the baby by rocking it and you know, doing that mother ease. That's rocking it and holding it and gazing into its eyes. She's passing that oxytocin. She's soothing the baby. So the baby learns to soothe itself. And if she does it correctly, then when the baby grows up, it's learned how to soothe itself. If the mother doesn't do this, I know this one, if she you know, doesn't hold the baby or doesn't really look at the baby, the kid doesn't know how to soothe itself later on. And that could lead to antisocial behavior or criminality or just a shutdown. So if you didn't learn to soothe yourself when you're little, you can learn it later on because the brain changes all the time. All the time, we're never locked in a stone. The brain is malleable, it's a feast of these neurons that if you train them, they change. So here's a way to get, I give you a little list on, first of all, how to get a hit of oxytocin, which is <laughs> go do something nice. It switches it on, even if just fake it to make it, you know, go to a home and say hi to everybody, you know, smile at somebody you pass in the street, send a postcard to kids in the hospital, maybe clean up the rubbish in your neighborhood or go up to someone who works for the NHS and thank them. <laughs> Just find something that you're grateful for or that makes you feel good or that you're grateful for. You can make a list. Of course, I have an area in the book where you can say, um, you know, even when I, I don't know, I can even thank my body for not having pain or I have kids. I can make a living by writing. I can be funny. You know, bring to mind something that you're grateful for. Um, so let me tell you how to bring in this positivity, let's say into the body. So let's go back again to where we felt that emotional twang. Again, closing your eyes, keeping them open. Come forward, put your feet on the ground, bum on the chair, breathing. And let's go back, maybe create the same sense, that emotion, whatever your habit is or a new one, let's say that upsets you or makes you sad or something negative and feel where it is in your body, heartache or anger, where is it? And now bring an image to mind, another story that lifts your heart, you know, you, I don't know, somebody said hello, your kids sent you a card, you have a cat and you remember stroking it, just intentionally bring to mind something that delights you. And now just slip down, drop down and feel where that is in your body. That feeling of joy or bubbling and just see if it takes over the other feeling. Notice how you go from darkness maybe into light or there's no change and really savor that feeling of that this positive 
experience makes you feel in the body. And breathe into it. Just experience what it is in the body. And notice what happened to the negative feeling. Is it still there? Is it pulling? And just before you finish, let's maybe put your hand where you think your heart is. Could be, it's just around where you think it is and breathe into that area so your hand lifts and then comes back down. So it feels like you're breathing into your heart. See what that does to your emotions. Maybe patting that area, but just feeling that specific area of your body. And maybe something else you'd like to do just to shift, shift your regular default mode. Just intentionally just smile a little bit, not, not big, just if you can feel the ends of your lips go up. Not a lot, just feeling and breathing. Okay, you can stop. So this isn't to suddenly, you know, break open the champagne and celebrate. You know, it's not, if you tell people to be positive, sometimes people go, oh God, I can't do that. So something must be wrong with me. But you're just training the brain, you know, to start feeding in, feeding in some oxytocin and how to bring it in maybe in the beginning artificially, but gradually when you do feel change or uncertainty or uh, you know something like the pandemic, of course you're gonna be afraid, of course. But at least this being able to pull down some of the cortisol means you're not stressed about stress. As I said before, the cortisol might, the um, COVID may not get you, but you know the, the trauma will. So what you're trying to do is bring down, bring down that uh, sense of panic. And then I have an exercise for dissatisfaction, which is another uh, one of our big fears where I ask you, it's a questionnaire to write down, just get to know yourself again, write down what you, what you want and can't have, and then write down what you have and don't want, and then write down what you think would make you happy and then what ultimately you know won't make you happy, but you still want it. And then ultimately, as I said again, you know it won't make you happy, but you crave for it. I said that before. And then just let me finish. As I said, I was talking about death, which is the wake up call of all wake up calls. Uh, again, to know that, that nature, like nature, there's um, a relinquishing, there's a letting go, makes life more poignant, as I said before, so that every moment counts. And um, we could do a little exercise. So you get a sense of that. All right, if you don't want to do this, don't do it. But I, I do do a questionnaire. If you had five minutes to live, what would you do? 10 minutes, what would you do? An hour, what would you do? Two years, I think it's really good to know. And the bucket list is, is a good thing to know what you wanna do. Also, you know, out of the pandemic, who do you wanna see? Who don't you wanna see? These are kind of questions, self-reflection that I think at this point are really important. And again, knowing that everything changes and nothing is permanent, it's really important to focus. What do you want? What do you wanna do? Don't follow the next guy. Don't look on social media, really get to the heart. What are your thinking? What are your habits of feeling? But who are you underneath that? And only by settling that cortisol will you ever get to the, what you really want. Not who you are, but what, what gives you pleasure? When does your heart tingle? So we're going to finish with a little mindfulness about impermanence. All right, so just sitting and breathing, feet on the ground, bum on the chair, so you really feel held, supported. 
Your body can relax because you're not holding it rigid. You're breathing again, the whole body breathing, like a bellows is filling you up and you're releasing it. And then just imagining that when you exhale, it might be the last time you exhale. So there's a real stillness and a letting go, letting it all out. And when the lungs start filling with air, which they will, you feel a life coming back into you. You maybe want to feel like it's light or something warm. And then when you want to exhale, it's a release. Maybe darkness is released or you picture this is something very dark, releasing, leaving your body. And as you breathe in, you're filled with a light or that tingly feeling. And you can just do that for a minute, releasing darkness bringing in light. Okay, you can stop. So I hope that um, <clears throat> made you interested in how to work the book. As I say, I'm using mindfulness to deal with the huge uh, realities that we have to face, not to um, make light of them, but to be able, as I said, to surf the waves. If you understand everything changes, and if you understand what your natural reaction is, you know, where your mind flips and these thoughts start going, I don't want it to change, nothing should change. Oh my God, I'm getting older. That's your loop tape, bring it back to the breath. The thoughts will come a million times, but as I say again, there's a way of observing them. I don't like getting older. I don't like knowing I'm gonna die. You know, I worry about my kids, but I'm, I, every day I do mindfulness. I don't like it, but I like the results is that I can have a little objectivity. These are themes of thinking. They are not reality. I mean, I'm gonna die, but they're not facts. I'm not going tomorrow. My kids are okay. You know, I'm still breathing and that I'm grateful for. So does anybody have any questions? That was amazing. Thank you, Ruby. Um, so yeah, like Ruby said, if you've got any questions, please just drop them into the Q&A box and we will ask them. Uh, one of the ones that has come in, which I quite like is, what have you added to your bucket list during lockdown? What I've added to my bucket list is I wanted to get this book out <laughs> and I didn't have that long to write it. And my bucket list was to write a mindfulness guide for survival and I did it. So that's ching, that's check. Uh, yeah, so you need yeah. to find a new one tomorrow. <laughs> um, so we've got a question here from Emma who said that um, I always feel my stress emotions as a tightness in my chest. Uh, recently, I've been having a, a horrible recurring dream of a fear of dying in my sleep. Um, do different emotions felt, uh, sorry, are different emotions felt in different parts of the body? And if so, why and can, why and can we understand what that is trying to tell us and the process involved? Uh, can mindfulness both reactive, uh, can we use mindfulness reactively as well as proactively? Well, you do, you feel a stabbing in the heart, you know, and, and that's heartbreak. You feel what, what those other emotions are described pretty accurately. Uh, you're stabbed in the stomach or it's, it's stabbed in the heart or sick to your stomach. That's pretty much physically, you're, you're, there's an area of the brain that can't tell the difference between physical and mental. So when you're stabbed in the heart, you could be, it's very similar and activates the same pain area. When you take your focus to it, um, when you take your focus to that area, what it does is it stops the rumination a little bit. If you just feel pure, pure physical emotion, 
okay? It isn't so solid. Your body can take a lot more pressure than your mind because again, this body, it doesn't ruminate. It just feels it. And if you really zero in and even on a physical pain, it does shift, it shifts, nothing is solid. Whereas thoughts just keep going. So if the question was, how do you deal with it? And does it make these emotions better to know where they are? Um, yes, if you keep thinking about it, they'll exasper it'll exasperate the feeling. But if you, it sounds so counterintuitive because nobody wants to face pain, but better you know it than um, it takes you by surprise. Did I say this? If you run from the monster, it chases you. If you face a monster, it runs from you. I must have said that before. Does that yeah. answer? Oh, sorry, I didn't catch you then. Oh, does that answer the question? Uh, yes, I believe so. If not, just drop it in the chat box and I can re-ask re again. Um, so I'm gonna bundle a couple here together because they're along a similar theme of, what's the best way to make practice? Um, so make it as a habit, but also find time to do it. And there's a couple of attendees here that say they're crazy. They've got three kids, they're working from home. Um, how do you do it when you're writing a book and doing all the amazing things you do every day? So how do you find the best ways to make a practice a habit? And how do you find time to fit it into your day? Well, I do it because I'm too scared not to do it. And it's, I tell you, it's a horror show all those thoughts coming in, my usual themes, I'm gonna fail, I'm not gonna pull it off. But what happens is eventually the thoughts give up. <laughs> you know, you just go, okay, keep them coming. Actually, if you invite the thoughts in, they sometimes disappear. But um, you don't have to do a sitting. You can do mindful moments, which means, you know, let's say, I don't know, you're in the loo or there's a moment you're not with the kids or you're not doing something like you're standing in a queue or you're drinking coffee you can use those moments for mindfulness because tasting is another sense. So if you're drinking coffee or you're eating, again, if you don't watch where the thoughts go and come back to the taste and let the thoughts go and come back, you're not doing the sit up, okay? You have to notice thoughts, bring it back. That's how the insulin gets buff. And you know, other parts of the brain that are responsible for lowering cortisol attention becoming present. Whatever you do, if you're gardening, feel what you're doing in your hands. But if you get lost in it, that's fun too. You know what I mean? You'll get kicks out of it and endorphins. But mindfulness means watch where your thoughts go, come back. And the more horrific the thoughts, I know this seems bizarre, um, the stronger the weights are uh, for working out your insula and other areas. You know, it's, it's almost like they're resistance. So, you know, it's like going to a, a gym. It's like lifting weights, but um, having nothing to push against, you know, they aren't there. So the worse the thoughts are, <laughs> really, the worse they are, and you come back to the breath, the tougher you get. You know, you're used to having those stress storms, but you don't ignore them and you don't repress, them. you notice them, you notice, you know, the, the themes, you face them and you face your emotions. and eventually you get the idea that they aren't solid, they keep coming. And if you hold on while there's this horror show going on, funnily enough, the thoughts can go positive. Suddenly there's joy. But if you get caught in that habit, you'll never feel the sun. Brilliant. And a lot of um, comments in the chat uh, where you're talking about chasing the monster, standing up to it is, people saying the next thing on your bucket list should be a kid's book. <laughs> um, the Mindfulness Guide for the Frazzled, which is another book. And there's a chapter on what to do with kids and how to teach them mindfulness. And, uh, but don't, they don't call it mindfulness because uh, you know kids wouldn't know what that is, but they teach kids how to lower their cortisol by playing games. Um, and there's games that they teach in schools. There's a, a course called Dot B. I put that in my book so parents, they teach that in schools, it's mindfulness in schools, but parents can use some of those tools at home with their kids. But the one thing that's important is for a parent to teach or a teacher to teach, you have to walk the talk. You can't tell a kid to lower their stress unless you're you know, in that state because you pass your state to your kid or to everybody else because we work like neural Wi-Fi. So if you can cool your engine and actually show compassion, they'll pass that to the next person. That's how you soothe them. 
even when they're not babies. Practice mindfulness and then your kid might not know what you're doing, but they'll go, oh, I want some of that. Fantastic. And I know in your, your book and now for the good news, you've got great lists of businesses and schools that are kind of putting these practices in. Yeah, that's um, the book. And now for the good news. Yeah. So buy that one as well, everybody. <laughs> now, and that, now for the good news gives a list of, um, it's like a Michelin guide for where great things are happening. Uh, and for example, in schools, the schools that are now teaching emotional intelligence, even in deprived areas, you can steal some of that and use it with your kids. Brilliant. Um, so I've got a question here from Alison saying that she's studying stoicism um, and she wonders, in your opinion, how does that relate to mindfulness? Uh, do you want to talk about what stoicism is? Um, we can, if you want. <clears throat> does she want to say, I think it's like when you're just accepting what's, uh, what is um, and dealing with the realities. I think the book is stoicism. <laughs> the stoics would agree it's um it's it's facing realities and it's being brave in the face of something that's unpleasant it's not sticking out your chest and bravely walking through it it just means what is is boy and that takes a lot of work very few people are natural born stoics but i think mindfulness is is in that world it's just learning to accept but not be a sucker <laughs> you know be kind to yourself that's self-compassion, I think, when you just float over it, sail over it. But as tough as it is, you'll feel it. But don't get carried, don't get swept by it. I think that's stoicism. Yeah. And um, Jenny's asked here, so what would you say is the best practice for panic and anxiety? I know that I'm catastrophizing and I'm aware of this, but I can't stop helping getting into the core of what if, what if, what if. Are you saying what would you, what to be done? Does mindfulness help with that? Yeah, is there a specific um, practice, whether that's breath or taste, or what do you find works best in those moments? If you can just, let's say you're at a bus stop, listen to sound, watch where your thoughts go, come back to the sound or feel the wind on your face, but notice your, you know, the story, come back. Um, it's not for everybody. Mindfulness doesn't work for, if you're traumatized, I wouldn't say go near it. If you're in the depth of depression, I wouldn't do it because you haven't got a mind. So what's there to watch? But um, the what if, what if scenarios is when you go to raw sensation, just focusing on it, the whys and the wherefore stop. You're trying to, the mind will roll on, but you don't want to get caught in the web. And the whys and the wherefores for me, of course they come in, of course I lose my temper, but this distancing, you know, and understanding it's a habit and humans have to think why, they have to problem solve, but there's things you can solve and there's things that are a waste of time. So we do think in the future and in the past, that's what's brilliant about humans. Oh, what's gonna to happen tomorrow? What did I do in the past that will help me be successful in the future? But if we're always stuck in that, you're never gonna be in the present. And that's where everybody wants to live once in a while, not all the time. But you, you know, the brain is more flexible when you're not trapped in what if, you, you know, come, how do you know what if? Are you soothsayer? We don't know. And I think that's also saying, why, why take that strain? There's enough to worry about. <laughs> what if? That'll, that's what got people crazy during COVID. What if? You've got to think a little bit, like, don't leave your house, what if? But if you start, you know, going, oh, my God, the world's going to end, like the news wants you to think, you'll get ill. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the eternal question. Um, so I've got an attendee here that's saying, um, I think I've come a bit shut down and numb from not being able to handle stress for such a long period of time. Uh, my worry is that if I were to do these practices, suddenly the floodgates will open and I will crumble. Is there a way that they can safely remove one brick at a time? I, yeah, I totally agree. It's the most fearful thing to look in. But some of my workbook is questionnaires. You know, it's not all mindfulness. So it gives you a little dip of, you know, you're dipping your toe into self-awareness and you're writing down, for example, um, habits of thinking, there's drawings where you might be feeling something and you draw in the body where, where you're feeling something. So you're getting to know yourself gently. 
And then I give you exercises for how to deal with those overwhelming emotions. But some of the book is not mindfulness. Some of it is actually questionnaires, things to draw, things to reflect on. If mindfulness isn't for you, back off. But uh, the results are so interesting. And you do take it a little at a time. You know, in the beginning, one minute is okay. Just one minute of drinking coffee, watching where your mind goes, come back, take a shower, feel the water. You know, the other thing you're doing besides insight is you're teaching yourself to be present. Now, that's the greatest gift you can give yourself. If you feel the water, if you taste the coffee, you're present. So forget about learning about your mind. Just you're practicing being in, in the moment. And the only way you can do that is by coming to your senses. So use the book for that. And there's instructions on how to come into the present. And the last one is mindfulness or things that I'm giving you in the book will help you be more compassionate to yourself and then to others. Yeah, and, and that's what the book is brilliant at as well. It's so, um, so easy to kind of pick it up and do a little bit, put it back down pick it back up it's really accessible I've, I've been lucky enough to read the book and I don't know how we all survived before we had it um, so thank you for that so I've got another question here from an attendee saying my mind and body has been mush uh, slab of clay for the last two days um, I've not been able to motivate myself to do any of my university work despite the deadlines of next week how can I motivate myself to get going why am I not prioritizing my work how can I get out of this fog well, that's what happens with thoughts when, when the cortisol, when the stress is too high and the stress was too high uh, during, the, um, during the lockdown. I'm telling you, it's, you know, when people go, I can't read a book, they really can't read a book. And to punish yourself for that will exasperate the, um, will exasperate the cortisol and, you know, you'll snowball. There's something in the book um, where, uh, you deal with how to deal with change, which is just, there's a calendar of every day of the week, sorry, every day within the month. And every day you, you use a different color that says your mood, you know, so, and you can decide, let's say red is really hot, you know, and bothered. Yellow is the sun. You get about 10 different colors. If all you can do every day is just put down your mood, you know, get a little distance, you'll notice after the, you know, after a week, that the moods are like this. In a way, you know, when you're in the red, leave yourself alone. There will be a moment. It's not going to stay red every day. There's a yellow moment. When you do that, maybe get in a couple things, but you'll see how your mood shifts like this. It's almost like um, be kind to yourself. If you give yourself a break to, to be down get in the bed. I don't know what's wrong with that. But when you see it slide up, if you're really aware, and that's, I think, what mindfulness teaches you, when the sun comes out, then you could do a few things, but not a lot. Just give yourself little activities. During lockdown, I, you know, when we were doing Frazzle, a few people said, I wash my hair and everybody would go like this, just a little at a time. Don't be mean to yourself. Believe that you are really not lazy, but that your brain fogged. Now your job is to get the cortisol down, but it isn't by nagging yourself. So there are exercises to help you be kinder to yourself, but it's not overnight. No, no, no. Um, so I've got another question here. Um, well, one comment that's come in that I think you might find quite amusing. I think you brought up some trauma for someone. Uh, my fish was always changing color and now I've realized why. Um, <laughs> so obviously, their, their mom and dad were replacing the fish. Um, so I've got a question here from Emma. Um, I have tinnitus, uh, a buzzing sound due to MS in one ear. Uh, do I still do the sound senses uh, part of mindfulness? Um, or is that something that I should maybe concentrate on something else? Or will that also work for me? Well, you, you, only you will know that. That's a really interesting one. That's a really interesting one. I mean, Kabat-Zinn, John Kabat-Zinn, who was a molecular biologist who started this whole thing, worked with people who had chronic pain um, and a lot of them uh, were suffering from cancer. And the, the people at University of Massachusetts Hospital gave up and he started to work with them. And he had them focus on the painful area, which was so counterintuitive. 
I don't know if you focus on the sound and it starts to change, you know, so that you notice it's not always there. Sometimes it goes, sometimes it's come, but it sounds so bizarre to focus on it, to notice that. Um, I, I don't know what to say. It's not my area. I think if you try to avoid it, it might be, become more disturbing. The idea is to become, to somehow make peace with it. And I don't, you know, that's not my area, but I know with physical pain and it, and it had such great results is let's say the person had, I don't know, a broken knee, focus in on it and it throbs and it aches, but moments it starts to shift and sometimes it disperses a little bit. So they know it's not a solid thing, but I'm your areas. I'm so sorry. That's horrible. Yeah, um, but then, like you said, there are lots of other practices within the book that they can use. So it's it's still a practice they can find that suits them. You know, um, there's, a whole there's a lot of practices that aren't mindfulness, but they're self reflection, and you learn about yourself. Yeah. Um, so I've got one more question here. Um, how would you recommend dealing with um, and clamping down on emotions that are from a long term bereavement? Well, again, that's heartache. Um, we're supposed to mourn, humans mourn, animals mourn, but if it goes on and on, it becomes chronic. Either, you know, if you join a bereavement group, because I think, you know, community is sometimes half the cure. And actually when we're in community, we switch on each other's oxytocin, which is the antidote to cortisol and to stress. Um, but mindfulness might be interesting because it is a, it's a physical pain. And again, if you stop the stories, not stop, but, you know, curb them a little bit, dampen them down and just feel it, it shifts. It's the stories, it's the reliving, it's the trauma that keeps that pain going. So again, it's learning to be kind to yourself. It's compassion. It's understanding why you feel the pain. You're not making it up but it's, it's getting a kind of detachment. The stories will slow down. And actually when the stories slow down, the emotions go or lighten up. You'll always have pain, but it won't be so intense. Well, really interesting. So just to bring it back to the tinnitus thing, I've had two attendees just get in touch while you were speaking. Uh, one uh, said that I have tinnitus in both ears. Uh, and as a practitioner in MRE, uh, and I focus on the sound and the sensation and it eases uh, the frustration and also eases my stress. Um, and another attendee's fed back that I have tinnitus and can focus on the ringing during meditation. I can now see that the ringing does change and sometimes I don't notice it at all. So it sounds like, um, it, like you were saying earlier, the sound practice could actually really work because you're concentrating on that particular thing um so yeah very interesting thank you for those questions um i've got a question here um from a lady, I, maybe i won't name her because she's mentioning her husband um i'm doing a lot of work on myself at the minute with mindfulness and feel like i'm really evolving but i keep getting stuck and because i get cross and frustrated with my partner any tips to figure that out <laughs> as a happily married woman yeah i mean my husband is here and I give him the people you're closest to really get the brunt of your anger. We're not perfect. You know, at least I'm nice to more people than I'm not, <laughs> but don't, I don't know what to do. That one throws me because um, really the people that you know, the most get it. Maybe if you both do mindfulness, I mean, it, he doesn't, uh, maybe you could breathe together. I know I meditate with my kids. And it's the greatest thing for conflict resolution is by, you know, by slowing down that cortisol. And then you can speak rather than when they talk to you, it, it ignites the memory of the last argument. So it really is a good way of cutting, you know, cutting the habit. But um, I do it too. I give, I'm terrible to my husband. I don't know why he sticks around. Shall we ask him to leave the room so you can give the other version? And <laughs> see, I just call him. It's his. gone. Yeah. It's gone. It's left me. Fair enough. Well, 
I'm glad, I'm glad that we've um, we got that live. <laughs> um, so I've got a question here. Uh, would you recommend uh, using mindfulness as a way of helping with PTSD? That is really interesting. I don't, I wouldn't say so, but maybe other people would. I think trauma is a whole, EMDR is supposed to be really good, but again, different things work for different people. It, you know, I wouldn't look in a mind that was traumatized. And there's a real difference between um, panic and anger and anxiety and real trauma because the mind is buried that memory for a reason because it will go into shock. Uh, so a different kind of therapy to gently, gently bring that out so that the left brain can handle what the right brain is doing because there's a reason why they bear, why it's buried. It's self It's survival. I would say not mindfulness. You know, um, there's. I just would say no. Yeah, like you said, it, it works for some things, and some things you just need to have alternative treatment for. Um, one of the attendees, Claire's, just asked, "How would you recommend that I stop thinking that people hate me? Um, I'm finding myself hiding in my house because of this." Hmm. Yeah, I, that's one of my themes too. Cognitive therapy, which is also something in the book is really good. You know, when you notice that you're always thinking people hate you, sometimes they do, but not everybody. And I think awareness is everything. You know, CBT is really, cognitive behavior is really good for that. Mindfulness is cognitive therapy because you're the therapist and you notice, I always think people hate me. They just hate me. Eventually, if you write it down, they hate me. CBT, which I take, I stole a lot from, is you write it down, then you write um, how, you know, how um, hot is it in you? What's the emotion? Is it 100 or is it 50? Then you write what really might be the situation? You know, what, what, you know, do they really hate you? What might be going on? And because you're writing down that there are other possibilities, then you write at the end, what are your emotions now? And it might have changed. It might be 30 rather than 100. And so it really is getting to know this is a habit. Don't beat yourself up. There's a reason you have the habit. There's a reason. Maybe when you were young, everybody called you stupid. Um, and it stuck with you. You know, I was called stupid when I was young. But eventually, you break the habit. In some areas, I am not so smart. But in other ones, I am. And I think that's breaking free is to say, yes, sometimes they don't like me, but not all the time. It couldn't be all the time. It doesn't exist. Yeah, I've got a question here in regards to relationships with parents. Um, so you mentioned earlier about your hearing your parents' voices in your head and that being one of the criticisms. How would you, as a, as a mom yourself, um, recommend parents avoid that with their own children? Or Say it again. Um, so I've got a question here from an attendee in regarding to the impact that parents have on, on us um, and how you mentioned earlier with your the, the criticisms you hear, your mother's voice, etc. cetera. Um, how would you recommend as a mother not to pass that on to your children? So when you're handling your kids? Um, either leave the room when you feel that you're about to lose it, you know, about to have a hissy fit. Uh, but again, it, it has to be either cognitive or follow my book or mindfulness, because you have to know the weather condition in your own mind. If you don't know it, you'll always project it onto somebody else. And then you'll think the kid made you angry. But what happened is you walked in there angry and they'll pick it up. So it has to be self-awareness again. That's the only way you're going to break free from your habits. You know how people have passive aggression. They think, oh, I'm being really nice, but they're showing their fangs. That's not knowing yourself. And what I mean that I don't mean, oh, there's a real story about me, but what's the habit? What do you do in front of your kids? There's one of my kids that I'm always slightly antsy with. Okay, if I, if I say, you know what? Did you notice that I'm slightly antsy? Did you notice? We don't have to discuss why, but if they know I know, it diffuses the situation. It's self-knowledge. You know, you might go in a room and say, you know what, I'm really nervous. The minute you say that, you're free of it because people are relieved that you know what you're coming in with. So it's always about self-reflection and write it down, draw it, sing it, you know, do mindfulness. One of those is going to work. And it's all in my book. 
yeah, available at all good bookstores. Um, so I have one quick question here, um, which is very prevalent, especially with the whole social media thing at the minute. How would you use mindfulness as a way to move away from constant comparison? Um, I can't seem to stop comparing to everybody else, and I really try not to. Well, the minute you say I can't, then you you're it's the self fulfilling prophecy. Again, you know, it's it's self awareness. Uh, everybody hates me. I can't stop. Write it down. Is this really true? When did you? When were you able to stop? Is there a second where you can't stop? Again, self awareness. Self awareness. If if you know, I always say I can't shut it down. Or, <clears throat> But there are moments when I can, so pat yourself on the back when you do. Or when I'm very kind, I don't, I go, oh, well, that was me because I'm really not kind. Notice it. Notice when you go the opposite way and congratulate yourself. It's about self kindness, too. Brilliant. And on the subject of self kindness, you have been absolutely wonderful uh, this evening, Ruby. So thank you so much for making the time for this event. Um, and talking about the new book, which, like I said, is an essential guidebook to kind of living today. Um, so we can't wait for the next one, not to put too much demand on you. Um, okay. My my shows for BBC are on, on BBC Two, August 26th. So it's all my stuff from the past, but I'm talking about it 25 years later. So there's Trump and there's OJ and there's Imelda Marcos and there's Madonna and Goldie Hawn. So on the 26th, if you could watch it, it's really interesting because <laughs> you get my point of view now. So I just thought I'd throw that in. No, no, thank you for that. Because some of you people will know you for your mindfulness words. It's great to know that before this, you, you were breaking up the mold on how to interview people and then everybody else has copied you since. Um, okay. Yes, the, the, someone's put here, which I completely agree on. I listened to that podcast actually. The original Louis Farouk. <laughs> I think, yeah, Louis, that's what, what Ruby was doing before everybody else started. Um, there's so much love in the comments for you, as always. Um, so thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for your new book. And I hope it's as successful as it should be. Everybody needs a copy. It should be mandatory. Um, and we hope to see you very, very soon with us. And yeah, th thank you again. And thank you everyone for joining us. The, those that have bought a book, they'll be dis dispatched by the booksellers tomorrow uh, and they'll be with you very soon. And the replay for this event will be available tomorrow morning for the next couple of days. So it was August the 27th, your new TV show. Fantastic. So that's on the BBC. That's the good news again because it comes out again, but it's done. I just thought I'll push everything. Um, that's my other book. Why not? We should do a little credits at the end of all, all of your books so people can just buy them. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you, Ruby, again for making the time. Goodbye. And we will see you all very soon. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Thanks. <laughs>